But, uh, due to the interdisciplinary nature of this meeting, the purpose of my talk is slightly different. I want first to dis describe and contrast two faces of the enterprise called uh, data science. And the second aim is to contest the current imbalance in the practices of that enterprise. And thirdly, I will show the two faces, how the two faces can operate symbiotically when properly balanced. Next, uh, even a cursory examination of the current education tools and vocabulary of data science researchers would reveal a sharp dichotomy between two highly successful, yet hardly communicating cultures. The first culture I would call data centric because it is driven by the paradigm that the bulk of useful knowledge resides in the data. Hence, it would be highly lucrative to search uh, next, to search for the um, nuggets of knowledge that we can find in the, let's say, sandy dunes of raw data. I don't know how, how far you are, Karu. Do you see the second bullet? Now we're on goal. On goal, good, good. Uh, next. The second subculture I would call science-centric. Uh, it is driven by almost opposite paradigm, according to which knowledge resides not in the data, but in the process that underlies the generation of data. Next, next bullet, please. Next bullet. You have to assure me that you have the next bullet. So just okay. me, read the first uh, word. Goal, and then and then the data uh, number one data number two known properties of that process. Good. So uh, the going. This is now a different goal and a different uh, uh, ideology. Going from um, notice, however, that the goal is not uh, um, is given up on finding the process that generated data, but it has a modest goal to go from to go from. Um, things that we know, feature that we know about that process to feature that we want to know. And notice that the um, data now is not the womb where you can find knowledge, but rather it becomes an instrument with the help of which we find those nuggets of knowledge which are desired, needed features of the process that generate the data. Going now from ideology to practice, we can look, we can see the difference in the tools that are being used by these two cultures. The first one, data centric, is using data fitting. And the second one, science centric, is using what I call data interpretation. The distinction can be seen again in the output of the uh, findings of the two cultures. One has the properties of data, the other has the properties of uh, the world outside the data itself. Um, I'll now change the title from the tales of uh, two data science cultures and I added two revolutions because as I said, these two have been highly successful and to the extent that they can be called revolutions. The first revolution is very familiar. That's the revolution of data science. 
And I'm not going to elaborate because you all read the New York Times and the New Weeks magazine. So you know the hype surrounding the possibility and the potentials of data science. The second revolution, which is not uh, that uh, uh, obvious to the general public and may not be or even obvious to some of the uh, participants in our session, is the causal revolution. Next slide. <clears throat> I'm quoting here Gary King from Harvard, where in 2014 he made a sweeping remark about the revolution of the in the causal inference section. More has been learned about causal inference in the last few decades than the sum total of everything that has been learned about it in all prior recorded history. I said it's very sweeping. Only people in Harvard can afford to make such sweeping um, generalization. So as a humble computer scientist, I have anchored it and tried to con concretize it in something that I understand. Namely, <clears throat> I define revolution to be hundreds of problems that are needed, that were needed, and thought to be impossible, that can now be solved using simple mathematics and tractable algorithms. So I sometimes call it victories, things that I wanted to do and I couldn't do yesterday that I can do today. That is my definition of victories and revolution. We have it now and I'll try to convince you that, that revolution has taken place. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I need to go to define my terms. What is causal science? Why it requires a new logic and a new inference engine? And before I do that, we have to, uh, um, no, it, it, it's not the, my outline, right? We are now on a slide called outline. Yes. Okay, good. So I'm going to talk about a few things. Here are the major, major um, topics. First, I'm going to define what I mean by causal science and why we need an inference engine. Second, I'm going to expose to you what I call the two fundamental laws of causal inference. If you have these two fundamental laws, you don't have to invite me to the next session. You can derive everything by yourself, with the pencil and paper. The third bullet calls for the seven tools of causal wisdom, which I'm going to go over them if I have time, one by one. If not, I would urge you to ask me questions about each one of them. And they <clears throat> describe the, how the tools of causal wisdom revolutionize existing sciences, how they clarify cognitive and social and legal and ethical questions. And <clears throat> I come now to the slide called what is causal science? And here I promise you a definition. It's going to be almost circular, but please bear with me. It's a logic and tools of answering causal questions. I started by asking what is causal science, and I end up by defining it using causal question. So I owe you a definition of causal questions, which I will expose in the form of examples. Here are examples of typical causal questions, and I'll go over the common denominators, uh, denominators among them. How effective is a given treatment in preventing a disease? Was it the new tax break that caused our sales to go up or our marketing campaign? <clears throat> what is the healthcare cost attributed to obesity? A big topic last year. Can hiring records prove an employer guilty of sex discrimination? And <clears throat> now personal decision. I am about to quit my job. Will I regret it? I marked certain words here in yellow for a reason. I can recognize them for five miles away because they constitute the difference between causal question, causal sentences, 
and non-causal sentences. They have something in common. Number one is they are <clears throat> asymmetric. You can see that preventing is asymmetric. Cause, of course, is asymmetric. I, I attribute cause to healthcare and not, I, not to what um, uh, to adversity and not to the healthcare cost and so forth. And second, we are unarticulable in the standard grammar of science, which means you cannot write a formula. You couldn't write a formula before 2000 year, uh, to the, uh, I should say before 1900, okay? You couldn't write a formula, actually before 1920, you couldn't write a formula to express the questions, not the answer, just the question. You couldn't write down the question uh, about what discrimination is or whether a treatment prevented a disease. Why? Because science has been very, non, non, uh, very unfair to us. Science has given us a language of algebra. Algebra surrounds the connective of equality. You see here, y is equal to ax on the very bottom. <clears throat> if y is equal to ax, then x is equal to y over a equality sign is symmetric. Whereas <clears throat> all these adjectives and yellow um, terms are asymmetric. If if x causes y, then y does not cause x. What, by replacing the equality sign with an arrow, I mean that nature looks at the value of x. The x could be, for instance, the atmospheric pressure and decide the um, reading on the barometer. That's y. Okay? It doesn't go the other way around. So we are talking here about a process which is very similar to what in computer science we call assignment. Nature looks at the value of the pressure and assign a value to the move, movement of the barometer. Sounds like a shofar. Can, are we okay at the last? Uh, okay. So, so the, everything that I'm going to say from now comes from this recognition that we need to have an algebra for the asymmetric operator called assignment, assignment operator. It's asymmetric and it does require a special algebra because we cannot use the arithmetic, algebraic uh, uh, notation anymore for um, all these beautiful terms that we ask questions about. Next slide. Now that we understand what causal questions are, we have to talk about the logic and tools of answering them. And I call this combination of logic and tools, I call it inference engine. It consists of three inputs, it, or it receives three inputs and delivers two outputs. Here are the three inputs. What we wish to know, what we do already know, and the kind of data which is available to us. So we need to have notation to express what we wish to know and what we already know and the, available, the type of available data. We have to distinguish the data that was generated by experiments from that which was obtained by passive observation. Now, what are the two outputs? The two outputs will be effect of pending interventions and effects of undoing past events, sometimes called counterfactual. <coughs> I go now to, if you try to be served to the uh, Karu, we are now on a three-level hierarchy, correct? Now, yes. Good. If you're trying to be serious about building an inference engine and you try to articulate the three inputs, 
and go through the logic of producing the three outputs, you find you find that you that mathematics imposes a certain restriction. Hey, we have some very strange noise here. I'm not sure it's coming from me or from someone else. Hello, noise. Oh, okay, now we don't have it anymore. Okay. <clears throat> there are rules and principles that you cannot violate. There are constraints that you cannot circumvent. I'll call it the anatomy of causal reasoning. They act like um, conservation law in physics. They tell you that you cannot build a perpetual motion machine. There is a cons something called conservation of energy, conservation of momentum. This all comes from the mathematics. And if <clears throat> it so happens that you can arrange it in a hierarchy. So that this hierarchy looks as conceptual and has a very nice ladder on the left going from um, owls and robots to a caveman and to Einstein on top. But <clears throat> Trust me, it is uh, a result of hard mathematics. And recently, um, Elias wrote a paper about the um, formal logic of that hierarchy. Okay. The nature of this hierarchy is that you cannot answer any questions in level I unless you have assumptions or data of the type I or higher than that. For instance, you cannot answer questions about intervention here, uh, rank number two, unless you have either experimental data or you have assumption about how the world operates under experiments. Okay? <clears throat> or if you have higher than that, counterfactual. You cannot do it by, observe, by passive observation alone. So here are the typical questions you have in the bottom layer. This is what machine learning, the majority of machine learning is all today. Um, intervention layer is what you get when you have uh, results of um, <clears throat> controlled experiments. RL is about one and a half level over between rank one and R2 and uh, rank two. I'll explain later why I mean by one and a half. And um, counterfactual, of course, imagination, retrospection, understanding, going from uh, effect to causes as opposed to causes, uh, effect of causes, from, from effect to causes and answering question about what was the cause of a given specific event. Go, <clears throat> I'm going now to express to convince you that you cannot go from rank one to rank two on the basis of, of passive data alone. And I'm going to do it now using the famous Simpson paradox. And I'm going to do it in such a way that will demonstrate the mathematics required for proving that you cannot go from any rank to any higher rank. It's the same idea. Idea is to show you that data is not sufficient to do, data alone is not sufficient to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Namely, <clears throat> that there are two different models of the world that are indistinguishable about the data they generate and still give you a, a different or opposing answer to your query. That is the general mathematical method of proving that you cannot go from one rank to a, a higher rank. I'm going to do it using the Simpson paradox. Next slide, titled "Why Data Is Insufficient." I'm going to show here a scatter diagram describing um, the relationship between exercise and cholesterol. <clears throat> um, as you can see here. The correlation between the two seems to imply that the more you exercise, the higher cholesterol. 
which of course negates understanding of what the effect of exercise. And we have a very simple explanation to that. If we if you um, segregate the data by age. So the next slide shows you how this cloud of data points, these are individual, every dot is individual, is generated by collapsing different age groups. So you can see that a, given a specific age group, <clears throat> we get the right kind of relationship. The more you exercise, the less cholesterol you have, and we are all satisfied. And this is where textbooks on statistics end their discussion about the Simpson paradox. But we ask a more sophisticated question here. The most important question that we ask is, why is it not possible to, that, ex, that exercise is helpful in every age group, but is harmful for a typical person? Why is it, why it negates uh, some of, uh, why it generates a rebellion in your intuition? And why you can say that it's impossible to have a, a, such, a, a, such an exercise that will be harmful to every, um, to a, a typical person and will be helpful to every age group. We all rebel against that. Our intuition doesn't accept it. And that's why they call it paradox. And we ask why? Is there any logical rule that dictate that it, such an exercise doesn't exist? No, the answer is standard logic doesn't tell you that it is it, not violated by such a possibility. The only logic which I know that is violated by such a possibility is the logic of causal influence. Uh, we are going to ask now another question which shows the insufficiency of the data. And notice, by the way, that I'm going to convince you about the insufficiency without numbers. This is the beauty of this Simpson paradox it can convey the idea of impossibility to you without using any tables or numbers. Just look at the scatter diagram and the tendencies involved here. The next question to ask is exercise helpful or not? Suppose we got this in the data. Is exercise helpful or not? Most of us will jump and say, of course it's helpful because uh, it's more specific. We look at the exercise from specific age groups, and it is, and we see that um, a person, the more a person exercises, the less cholesterol. So we prefer the more specific data on the less specific, on the aggregated data, right? Wrong. The next slide shows you that in certain cases, data specificity goes wrong. And the, and the um, example I chose, I'm gonna show in, in the next uh, animation in a second. First, let's look at the violation of our nation. It's impossible to have a drug which is bad for men, bad for women. Uh, no, 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 sorry. From a drug which is bad for men and bad for women, we conclude by the logic of our intuition that it must be bad for people, fine. Now I'm going to change the setup and just change the story behind the data. Keep the data the same, but just change the story. And I'm going to move you to 19th century France, where people first had inoculation against smallpox and discovered that more people die from the smallpox itself, from the inoculation itself, than died from the smallpox. And everybody wanted to cancel a, a vaccine. And when in reality, the vaccine was eradicating smallpox. Okay. In this case, you see bad for <coughs> those who took, who are contacted smallpox, and it's bad for those who did not contact smallpox. And still it's bad, we want to conclude, not that it's bad for people, but it's good for people. So specificity <coughs> is not a good, uh, guidelines for deciding what to do for, for guiding our action. 
I finish my exposition and I hope I convince you without numbers that we have here same data that fits. Why do I say same data? Because it's generated by a complete graph and a complete graph can generate any possible data you can think of, any distribution. So here we have the same data which fits both stories. In one of them we said, um, more specific and the other one will say choose the less specific one so no data in the world can tell us if action is good or bad once we get this this gives you an idea of the nature of the mathematical proof that you cannot go from one rank of the ladder to another one because you have um, two the model of the world gives you opposite answer to your question even though they agree on the same data Okay, I now go to the next next slide and give you the two fundamental laws of causal inference, which I promise you. The first law is the law of counterfactual and of course intervention, because once you have counterfactual, you have intervention. And I asked yesterday, I asked Elias that if I die prematurely, please um, uh, inscribe this on my tombstone. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Why? Because it makes counterfactual embarrassingly simple. Once you have a collection of uh, structural equations, okay, <clears throat> counterfactual y sub x in every individual u is defined to be the solution for y in a mutilated model where you remove the um, the the arrows of the function going into x. Here's an example, m and m sub x. You simply solve the equation for y in a mutilated model and the answer is the counterfactual. Y had x, a variable x, taken on the value small x. Like everybody knows how to solve the equations. You have here semantics. From the semantics comes the logic, from the logic you can answer questions, and you're done. So this is the first fundamental law of counterfactual, or of, of uh, causal inference. The second one, I choose a disapparation. It's a law that allows you to connect the structure of your causal knowledge with your expectation about the data, with the constraint on the data. So if you see a separation in the graph, Look at the left hand side, x separate, separated from y given some z. You should expect to find conditional independencies in the data that is generated by that particular graph. I'm using graph here, you don't have, some people get irritated, they have allergic to graph, like economists. So I'll tell them, do it in your equations, forget about the graph. <clears throat> but, so if you have, um, that condition, um, <laughs> you can't explain it to, to economists because the separation in a system of equation doesn't exist. But if we, <clears throat> if we abstract equation in the form of graph, and this is something very easy to do, just remember who is argument of whom. So you have a graph, now you can talk about separation if two variables are separated by a third set of variables, once you see such separation in the graph, it tells you thou should expect to see conditional independency in the data if the data is compatible with the graph. And if it is not, great, we found testability. Namely, we have here a method of testing the compatibility of our model with the data. These are the two fundamental laws that if you acquire them, then you can continue the conversation and derive everything that I know that has been derived in the causal inference literature um, from these two. Let's continue. And the rule of statistics, of course, going from samples to distribution. <clears throat> Now I'm, I'm to the seven tools of causal science, which I promised you. And I'm going to list them here 
one by one and give you a summary of each one, what each one can do, trying to impress you that these are new tools that were not in existence before 1920. <clears throat> well, the reason I mentioned 1920 is because Sibyl Wright was the first guy to put down a formal notation for the question that we wanted to ask. What is the effect of X on Y? So tool number one will be encoding the causal assumptions in transparent and testable way. I talked already slightly about what I mean by testable way, and but encoding it in assumption in a transparent way is not as trivial as it sounds here, because you can see among ourselves, I bet among uh, <clears throat> participants in this session, there are people are still using the input, encoding the assumption using the language of Cantor-Taxel or uh, um, Rubin's uh, Neyman notation. This is not transparent because you immediately forget well, whether you have uh, articulated all your assumptions, whether they are consistent with each other. You cannot tell it from the notation whether it expresses your understanding of the um, working of the world. So it's not trivial. So that's tool number one. Tool number two, predicting the effect of action and policies. We talked about it. It, it, it. I didn't show you how it works. I'll do it if I have time. Ask me if you, if I don't have time. Tool number three, computing counterfactual. I mentioned that in the first fundamental law, which automatically generate a question to question, uh, answer to question of causes of effect, attribution, explanations, susceptibility. How susceptible is a given uh, class of patients to a given uh, treatment and so on. Tool number four, computing direct and indirect effects also goes by the name of mediation, which <clears throat> becomes very popular these days when we are talking about fairness, discrimination, inequities, and so on. All this comes from mediation, which by the way, cannot be defined unless you have rank three counterfactual logic. Tool number five, integrating data from diverse sources, also called fusion, which also encompasses the question of generalizability that Joshua started the session with, um, comes under tool number five. Tool number six, recovering from missing data. <clears throat> missing data is something which have been thought to be a statistical problem. Some even define causal inference as an exercise in missing data. <clears throat> I have discovered to my surprise and satisfaction that it's the other way around. Handling missing data is a causal problem because you get different answer if you assume a different uh, mechanism responsible for missingness. And the tool number seven is causal discovery, of course. You have a passive data and you <coughs> wish to find what structure are compatible with that data. And this is a work that have been pursued vigorously in uh, Carnegie Mellon recently, but uh, by Bernard and his group um, in, uh, in uh, Germany, in Max Planck Institute, and with a new book. Um, I've been neglected this area because I found so much interest in the other areas, the other tools from one to six, the common denominator among those two is, okay, I give you assumptions by the world. What can you do with it? Can you put them into use? This is tool number one up to six. Causal discovery has to do with a question of, I don't have any, any knowledge about the world. All I have is passively observed 
data. Can you tell me uh, something about the underlying structure? Can I, can I find a compact representation of the set of structure that are compact, compatible with the data? And can I then answer a question from that compact representation of the set of, com of compatible structure? This is all in tool number seven, causal discovery. And uh, I am now ready to go one by one and tell you the beautiful, magical uh, things you can do with each of the tools. Uh, I bet I have exceeded my time, although I did not time myself. So ask me questions about the tools or about any other um, things which I said and uh, which you have interest in. I, I'm waiting for guidance. So uh, we, we could give you a few more minutes and we, we don't want you to stop right in the middle. So if you feel, if you need a few more minutes to finish the, the, the arc, uh, you can do so. But if you, otherwise we can also enter the discussion now. We already have some questions uh, on the list. Oh, good, good. So I, I'll go quickly over the, um, what do I want to go over? Okay, everybody in the literature contains a lot of results from tool one, two, three, um, even for the integrating data from diverse sources is something relatively new. So I will go to the slides at the tool, tool three. I'm now in tool, uh, I didn't speak about that, but I, sh I should because the recent um, breakout of the corona epidemic <clears throat> brought into the brought to attention the question of identifying patients in need, and <clears throat> I want to impress you with the um, idea that questions about patients in need is a counterfactual question. You cannot answer it with the logic of statistics even not with the logic and the tools of randomized experiments. Patient in need means a patient <clears throat> that is able to, one needs to answer a counterfactual question. What is the probability that the patient with characteristic C, small c, will improve if and only if treated? And the way to express it is something which is called probability of necessary and sufficient. That, <clears throat> that person would be alive had it been treatment. Have he, he or she been treated and will die otherwise. I'm using uh, extreme words like die and alive. You can say recover and get worse. Okay. But the idea is that you're talking about two different worlds. The world where <clears throat> a patient was treated, other world, argument is zero, not treated. And you want the conjunction of two entities, each taken from a different world under different conditions, okay, for a different characteristic. Uh, Yuda, can, can you confirm which slide should we be seeing right now? Uh, you are looking at uh, identifying patients in need. This okay, is the title you. of the slide. Okay. Are we there, Karu? Karu, are we in yes, the slide? Now, now we're there, yes. yes. Are we? Yes. yes. Okay. It turns out that the combination of experimental and observational studies can provide informative bounds on this entity called probability of necessary and sufficient. <clears throat> and in general, going from group data to individual behavior requires counterfactual logic. This is something that I want to impress upon the people who are working with <clears throat> questions such as uh, choosing, prioritizing patients for treatment, 
for hospital tests and, uh, and so forth. Um, the movement from, ex from group data to individual behavior requires counterfactual logic and we do have the counterfactual logic needed. All we need now is to operationalize it and to bring it to the attention of people responsible for deciding which patient should be tested for corona, which patient should be given a hospital bed. I will now go to the uh, tool number four, or I'll quit that because it's already in the literature since 2001, even earlier, by Robbins and um, uh, Greenland. <clears throat> and just to impress you that the question of discrimination, now we are on a counterfactual definition of discrimination, right? The question of the fairness and discrimination is a counterfactual question. It's defined as whether the employer would have taken the same action had the employee been of different race, despite the fact that we cannot control the race, we cannot control national origin, sex or age, we can still talk about age and <laughs> race to be the argument or the antecedent of the counterfactual. <clears throat> this is actually the definition used by uh, the court of law. Just uh, last week, somebody sent me another court ruling that upheld this definition. Definition is called but for. If it weren't for the, pay, the employer age, sex, religion, and so forth. So that's the counterfactual notion. We have now the tools for handling it. I'm not going to generalizability because that's how Joshua started the common interest that we have. <clears throat> the problem is how to combine results of several experimental and observational studies, each conductor on a different population and under different set of conditions so as to construct a valid estimate of effect size in yet a new population unmatched by any of those studies. This is the general problem of generalizability and data fusion put together. The generalizability in itself is only part of it, you see, uh, going from fine estimate effect of a new population unmatched by any of those studies. I normally display it in the form of a question about inter integrating data from various hospitals um, from Texas, Wyoming, Utah. The problem in real life goes like that. Each hospital has a different uh, type of population. Some are young, some are old, some are loyal, some are rich, some are that, uh, findings were taken under controlled randomized trial, some by observational data, and we need to find the, the effect size in the unobserved population in Arkansas. I love Arkansas for some reason because I've never been there. Uh, survey data, only survey data available. In <clears throat> logical terms, in more mathematical terms, it looks like that. You have assumptions that you can articulate in the form of a graph, characterizing what you know and what you don't know about each of the findings, each of the experiments. And you want to find uh, answer questions about the pink one, something that you know something about, something about the structure, <clears throat> and that you want to generally put all of these together, fuse it together, that's why we use the word, the word fusion, and um, Elias can tell you more about it. Um, you can look in our paper, which I think, yes, I handed, no, I didn't hand it out. It's the um, proceedings of the National Academy of Science, uh, where we talked about the general question of, of fusion. Notice that generalizability is one part of fusion. It has to, one needs to fuse or to, to generalize from <clears throat> experiments that you have 
to a shifting population. Uh, Yura, is it, uh, would it be a good time to start taking questions soon? Yes, it's a good time. Yes, because missing data is already in print. And yeah, it's a very, oh, no, 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 good time in the year. Conclusion. Yeah, the tools and principles of causal revolution are merging with those of big data revolution to shift data science from its current focus on data only to its intended focus on science. And I hope you, I convince you that the peak of this revolution is still ahead of us because we have some uh, very ambitious uh, programs to get social intelligence, answer to free will question, emotion machines, and on and on, all the futuristic dreams that you ever had about AI machine learning. Thank you, this joint work with many, many, many uh, co-workers, principal investigators, and times for commercial, the book of why, into some of the thoughts there are condensed in, uh, uh, I think, manageable and readable form. Thank you for being so attentive and for not interrupting me. I didn't allow you to interrupt me. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so you get a virtual applause uh, from everybody.